Good evening et bonsoir. My name is Catherine Spencer Ross, and I'm chair of the Heritage Ottawa Lecture Series Committee. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this evening's event. December's lecture has traditionally taken the form of a seasonal celebration, and this year is no exception. We have a fun lecture ahead, an updated version of one we enjoyed more than a dozen years ago. Many of us have memories of Christmas celebrations from our past that have stuck with us. I remember lit candles on the tree during a Christmas in Germany, as well as the wonderful Eaton and Simpson festive windows in downtown Toronto. Those of you who lived in Ottawa between 1956 and 1972 may remember the excitement associated with Freeman's department store's special Santa Claus train on the CNR line that transplanted children from Ottawa to a North Pole outpost where Santa was waiting to greet them. Our speaker this evening, Andrew Jeans, will, I expect, rekindle those memories. Before we get started, I'd like to express some thanks. Our lecture series is made possible by the generosity of our sponsor, Andrix Holdings Incorporated and Sandy Smallwood. Andrix has been a faithful sponsor of these free lectures, as well as of our walks and some publications. We're also grateful for an operations grant from the City of Ottawa and a heritage grant from the province of Ontario. I'd like to say a few words about membership. Heritage Ottawa is a membership-based organization, and we're asking you to consider supporting Heritage Ottawa by becoming a member or by renewing your membership or making a donation. Having a membership is really the simplest way of having a real measurable impact on heritage conservation in Ottawa, and donations help us offer programming such as this lecture for free. And right now, your support is more important than ever. It's only by having people like you behind us that we can continue to be heard as we respond to challenging issues such as the federal government's Bill C-23 regarding the Historic Places of Canada Act, as well as more local issues like the Central Experimental Farm or Lansdowne 2.0. Your help does make a difference. As well, being a member of Heritage Ottawa connects you with a really agreeable community of like-minded people who are interested in and care about and are often passionate about our history and heritage and the quality of the built environment in this city. So if you have already donated or are a member, we extend our heartfelt thanks. If not, I urge you to go ahead. Just go to our membership page at the website at heritageottawa.org. With a click of a mouse and your credit card, you're a member of this community. Ottawa is at the heart of a vast homeland whose history reaches back long before the era that we will feature this evening. For hundreds of years, Algonquin Anishinaabe peoples have been pressing for their Indigenous rights to be respected and their history to be understood. Heritage Ottawa makes efforts through our programs and partnerships to bring awareness to Algonquin history and heritage with events and programming. It is now a real pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Andrew Jeans is a career public servant in the heritage conservation field, as well as an amateur railway historian and an enthusiast of many different types of cultural heritage. He holds a degree in cultural studies from York University. Born and raised in Ottawa, and after considerable time living in Toronto, he now calls Kingston, Ontario home with his partner, daughter, and two dogs. Andrew has been delving into the history of the Santa Claus train for almost 20 years, and this evening will tell the story of the special Christmas railway excursion presented by Freemans, once one of Ottawa's most successful independent department stores. Andrew has agreed to take some questions at the end of his presentation. We are delighted to have Barry Podolsky join us to moderate this Q&A session. Although many of you I'm sure know or know of Barry, I'll share a few words about him. Barry was inducted into the Order of Ottawa in November 2021, recognizing his over 50 years of experience as an Ottawa-based architect, urban designer, and heritage consultant. He has been instrumental in the design, restoration, renovation and adaptation of buildings throughout Ottawa. Through his commitment to enhancing Ottawa's built environment, Barry has helped to make our nation's capital a more visually and culturally engaging city. 
Barry, we are greatly honored to have you as moderator for this evening's presentation. At the end of Andrew's lecture, Barry will remind you to submit your questions into the Q&A function on your screen. And with that, I'm now going to hand the evening over to Andrew Jeems. Thank you very much, Catherine. So I'm delighted to be uh, here uh, virtually uh, presenting to Heritage Ottawa tonight. Uh, I've done this presentation, I think, three times in total, and the last one was about 10 years ago. So it has been a while, but um, it's been a great joy to revisit uh, some of the research that I did in the past on this train and to remember some of the stories that, uh, that came out from uh, what was really a kind of magical uh, period in, in Ottawa's history uh, from the point of view of uh, really special activities at Christmas. Um, so I'd, I'd like to uh, begin my, my talk about the Freeman's train uh, by providing a, a little bit of context for the Ottawa of 1956 when the train started to run. So the city of 1956 uh, was a much smaller place than it is today, um, much more compact. The population was only about 350,000. Uh, this was still a big jump um, over the, the regional population uh, before the, the Second World War, which uh, in 1939 was, was only about 187,000. So it had grown considerably uh, largely because of the expansion of the federal government uh, due to the war. Um, but uh, it was still uh, a city that uh, relied on industry for a considerable amount of employment, particularly the mills at the Chaudière. Um, it was still a city that was uh, oriented around the railway tracks that had not yet been removed. Uh, most of the railway tracks that uh, ever existed in Ottawa uh, around the city and into its core uh, were still present in 1956. Um, the Queensway had not yet been built and construction wouldn't officially commence until uh, the following year, 1957, when uh, Her Majesty the Queen officially launched it in October of that year. Um, Jacques Grébert, the, the famous urban planner who had come up with a report making many recommendations for transforming Ottawa into uh, a modern 20th century capital city, um, had released his report in 1950, but by 1956, uh, most of the recommendations of that report were yet to come into the future. Um, and the automobile-oriented suburbanization of the city uh, had really not yet begun to a great extent. Uh, much of what was uh, the township of Gloucester and and, uh, and Nepean uh, remained farmland at this time. Um, the main shopping district was still very much in the downtown core, although some suburban malls had begun to open, including Billings Bridge in 1954, uh, the Westgate Mall in 1955, Carlingwood Mall in 1956, and uh, the Alta Vista shopping plaza also in 1956. Uh, so change was on the horizon, but uh, things were were still in many ways uh, as they had been uh, 10 years before and, and even uh, earlier than that. Um, so uh, I'm now going to take us uh, to the, the spot uh, in the bottom left corner there, below the Chateau Laurier, uh, you can see uh, the old Ottawa Union Station. And this was still very much a transportation hub for the city into the 1950s. Um, people were still taking the train. There were uh, a couple of dozen trains arriving and departing every day, uh, which could take you uh, as far as Vancouver uh, or to Montreal or Toronto, uh, as well as local trains that served branch lines running in uh, all the major uh, compass directions up the Gatineau Valley, uh, up the Ottawa Valley, uh, down to Prescott and Brockville and, and uh, east to, to, uh, to Montreal. Um, so the train was still very much a part of the life of the city. Uh, and that was important um, in understanding uh, how something like the Santa Claus train could come to be. Um, but, uh, but 
this was something that was was soon going to uh, start to fade from from uh, consciousness of uh, city life. One of the major complaints that people had about the uh, Union Station in the 1950s, in fact, was that it was really difficult to find a place to park your car if you were going to take the train. There, there simply wasn't enough parking downtown for for uh, passengers. And, and this was something that, of course, had not been conceived of when the station was originally built in 1912. So this is what uh, things looked like. This is actually not that recent a, a photo. This is uh, from about 10 years ago. Um, and uh, the former Union Station building has gone through quite a transformation uh, in the last uh, 10 years as it has become rehabilitated to become the temporary home of the Senate of Canada while the center block is, is under its own renovations. Uh, so what you see is, is not quite in this photo what, what you would see if you were to go and stand out on uh, the Laurier Bridge, uh, or sorry, the, the Mackenzie King Bridge today. Um, but it's it's not that different, uh, um, and and certainly a lot has changed since the station closed in 1966. So uh, almost any traces of the railway, other than the station building itself, are are gone completely gone from uh, the side of the canal. And and somebody who was not familiar with the past of this place would really have no idea that it had been a passenger station at one time. Another thing that has changed uh, is, uh, and this is a bit of a digression, I admit, but um, uh, one at one time, Ottawa was characterized by a relatively extensive streetcar system. Um, Horse-drawn streetcars were first introduced into Ottawa in 1866. Uh, and then in 1893, the Ottawa Electric Railway began running an uh, electric streetcar system through downtown Ottawa uh, and ultimately extended well out into the suburbs uh, in the west, the east, and the south of the town um, and drove the first wave of what could be called suburbanization. But it was, it was a very fundamentally different kind of suburbanization uh, than what followed after the Second World War. Um, the city took over the privately owned system in 1948 and then uh, eliminated streetcar service altogether in 1959. If you were to stand there today, uh, where this photo is taken, uh, underneath you, uh, quite deep, would be the tunnel for the Ottawa LRT system. Um, you can see with Union Station's front entrance in, in, the, in the background, though, uh, that although it may have been difficult to find a place to park near the station, it was very easy to catch a streetcar from there. So a very different mode of uh, getting around the city and understanding how the city worked. Um, stepping back a little further into the past, I want to talk about the Ottawa Electric Railway because there's a Christmas connection here. Um, on Christmas Eve of 1896, it was in fact the Ottawa Electric Railway that first ran a sort of Santa Claus special uh, where they decorated a streetcar with uh, garlands and a fake chimney on the roof and uh, reindeer and, and a place for, for Santa to stand, um, protected one hopes from, from any uh, overhead electrification. Um, and this uh, streetcar, uh, ran all through the city uh, uh, over the entire streetcar network. Uh, and you can see the crowds that gathered to watch Santa Claus go past. Um, Santa Claus himself was uh, played by um, both um, Thomas Ahern, president of the Ottawa Electric Railway, and his business partner, Warren Soper. According to newspapers uh, from the time, uh, each of the two took a turn on, on the roof of the streetcar wearing the, the Santa outfit. Um, the Santa Claus streetcar did not run in 1897, but it did run again for one last time in 1898. So that's uh, just a little digression to talk about uh, another interesting Santa episode from Ottawa's past. Coming back to 1956, uh, the retail market in Ottawa was uh, dominated uh, very much by locally owned businesses. Ottawa uh, had quite a number of uh, very successful at that time locally owned department stores. Uh, these included Kaplan's and Ogilvy's, Murphy Gamble and La Rocks. Um, uh, 
these were all located uh, within the downtown core uh, on two major streets, Spark Street and, and Rideau Street. Uh, the biggest and most successful of the Ottawa-based department stores was AJ Freeman Limited, uh, which was at 73 Rideau Street. And in, you can see in, in the center of this um, nighttime photo from a cold winter's night in the 1950s, uh, the Freeman sign on the side of their building on, on the north side of Rideau Street. Uh, they also cleverly uh, put a illuminated sign on the south side of Rideau Street, uh, which was visible from the Chateau Laurier so that out of town guests uh, perhaps could be in, in, enticed to go and shop at Freeman's. Um, and the sign said, uh, the shopping center of Canada's capital. So that was really uh, how they presented themselves. Uh, as a business, uh, and and in many ways, they they really were uh, at the heart of uh, not just business life, but but civic life. Um, the Freeman uh, story begins with uh, Archibald J. Freeman, uh, who was born in 1880 uh, in what today is Lithuania. Um, at the time, it was still part of the Empire of of uh, Russia. Um, and he emigrated to Canada with his family, uh, arrived in Ottawa in 1899 and went into business uh, with a gentleman named Moses Kramer, starting a business called the Canada House Furnishing Company. Um, about three years later, that business moved into the location at 73 Rideau Street. Uh, and uh, very shortly thereafter, um, Freeman and Kramer ended their partnership and uh, A.J. Freeman went into partnership with his father. Um, uh, that lasted for about another 14 years and then uh, Freeman took the business uh, into his own control completely. Uh, and so it remained uh, within uh, his control and then his son's control uh, up until uh, they sold the business. Uh, so uh, A.J. Freeman was a very successful businessman, um, but someone who didn't necessarily see himself as a businessman first. Uh, he was also a philanthropist, a community leader, uh, both in the Jewish community in Ottawa, uh, also in the, uh, in, in the broader uh, uh, society of Ottawa. He was uh, close friends with many prominent people in Ottawa, including Prime Minister William Lyon Mackenzie King. Um, and uh, he was very active in uh, building up hospitals and uh, uh, schools and, and generally providing for the community. Uh, he was also a uh, very, very uh, ardent Zionist um, at a time when uh, Zionism was still uh, very much uh, a kind of uh, fringe political movement. Um, uh, remember, he died in 1944. Um, but this this is interesting because it informs some of the the, the contradictions and uh, things that that maybe from today's perspective don't necessarily make as much sense. Uh, A.J. Freeman and his wife were very loyal Canadians, very loyal uh, British subjects. Uh, Lillian Freeman, his wife, um, was herself a very important philanthropist and started the Poppy Drive. Uh, for uh, um, Canadian veterans of the First World War. Um, some of the very first poppies made in Canada were in fact made in her, her front room. Um, but they were also very, very uh, um, proud of their Jewish heritage and very concerned with uh, the fate of, of uh, Jews worldwide. So um, it's, it's, uh, it was an interesting uh, thread to, to have to, to follow to, or uh, um, to, to be able to manage these these different loyalties, uh, all while uh, remaining successful in business and, and in other aspects of life. Uh, Lawrence Freeman was very much the same. Uh, he took over the business from his father uh, after his father's uh, sudden death in 1944. Uh, he was also very prominent uh, in the cultural and philanthropic community in Ottawa. Um, he was a member of the Federal District Commission, which became the National Capital Commission. Uh, he was uh, the first chairman of the uh, of the committee that created the National Arts Center. Uh, he was involved in the creation of the Stratford Festival, um, and uh, also very involved again in uh, Jewish community affairs and life. Um, but both of them, 
uh, were very conscious of um, who their their customers were and uh, what mattered to their community. Um, and it was, I think, that that drove them in part, uh, even though Christmas was was not their holiday, but it drove them to um, really make a big deal out of uh, the Christmas holiday and the secular aspects of Christmas holidays at their store. So here's uh, the Freeman's store. This is actually from 1939 when the royal family was visiting. This is a very uh, popular photo of the Freeman's store. It seems to be the one that shows up in most publications if, if you're looking for a photo of the the front uh, facade of, of the store, this is the one you'll find. Um, but uh, here's a photo of, of one of their Christmas windows and uh, they were famous for their Christmas windows. Uh, very, very popular with uh, people in Ottawa who would come and, and look at these ornate displays, um, which often had nothing to do with goods that were for sale. They were simply um, uh, about the season. Another aspect of uh, Freeman's Christmas uh, uh, store uh, experience was their uh, Toyland, which was on the fourth floor of the uh, downtown Rideau store. And uh, it had a rideable uh, miniature train uh, that kids could ride on. Uh, this was something that uh, at uh, the time in the 1950s uh, was very popular with department stores all over North America. Uh, and the Eaton's department stores very famously had rideable miniature trains at their Montreal and Toronto and Winnipeg stores. Uh, but Freeman's had their own. So that was uh, something kind of neat. Um, the family sold the business in 1971 to the Hudson's Bay Company. Um, uh, this was a, a, a no doubt a very difficult decision and, and represented a, a very, very strong shift. Uh, many of their competitors had already experienced financial difficulty and some of them had had already gone out of business so perhaps they saw what was coming uh, and decided it was best to sell out to a national chain uh well the, the company was still um of considerable value um but uh in any case uh by 1973 uh, the Bay had completely removed any traces of the Freeman name from the store um and from uh, the other uh, satellite stores that they operated at Westgate. Uh, and uh, um, they had one other store that I can't remember exactly where it was located in the East End anyway. Um, so this is uh, 73 Rideau Street in more recent times, as you can see, um, uh, still the same building, but uh, operating as the Bay. Um, many other department stores have come and gone from uh, downtown Ottawa uh, since the 70s, uh, including uh, Eden's. Uh, Simpsons and Nordstrom's most recently, uh, but for now the Bay remains a survivor. But back to 1956, um, and uh, the the birth of the the Santa Claus train. So uh, Lawrence Freeman uh, came up with this idea and worked with the Canadian National Railway. Um, this was the first time anybody had really conceived of doing something like this, but they. Uh, uh, decided that uh, on a Saturday in, in the middle of November, um, a limited number of lucky children uh, and their chaperones uh, would be given the opportunity to ride a special train uh, over the CNR uh, to a secret location, and there they would meet Santa Claus and then come back with him to Ottawa. So uh, tickets were uh, free, but uh, limited in, in quantity. Um, only one parent could ride the train uh, with their children. Uh, there are a couple of different reports about how many tickets were given out in that first year, but most sources seem to agree that it was uh, 1,400 tickets in total, and that includes for chaperones. Um, according to the Ottawa Journal, this was the first time that uh, anyone had ever offered a special Santa Claus excursion train in Canada. Um, it also said, and this was a bit discouraging, that uh, for many children, this would be their first ever train ride. Remember, this was 1956, so uh, train travel was still relatively common, although on the decline. But uh, I guess for many young children, um, this would have represented their first opportunity to experience being on a train, uh, even if only for a very short time. 
So uh, the mystery location was, in fact, the village of Vars, which was about uh, 17 and a half miles or 28 kilometers uh, from the downtown Union Station. Uh, the first train departed Ottawa at 8.45 in the morning on Saturday, November 17th of 1956. Um, and it took about uh, half an hour to travel out to the village of Vars. Uh, Vars uh, had a small passenger station right in the heart of the village. Um, however, it was not practical uh, for various reasons, uh, as you will soon see, for the train to stop at the station. So rather than stopping at the station, uh, the train stopped in a field just on the uh, edge of the village. Um, and uh, there, uh, Santa Claus arrived uh, by a helicopter. Uh, the helicopter and its pilot were provided by uh, the Ottawa-based company Spartan Air Services, uh, which was a very successful aerial survey company operating out of Ottawa uh, in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, and uh, the, the children that you see here did not come off the train. The, the, uh, the passengers on the train were not allowed to disembark. Uh, even though the, the location had supposedly been kept a secret, somehow it had leaked out. And a couple of hundred children from the surrounding area had converged on VARS uh, to see Santa Claus arrive in his helicopter. So these are all local kids um, that you see uh, standing around Santa Claus here. Um, and uh, that uh, continued to be uh, what happened in subsequent years. Of course, uh, um, from then on, the secret was, was out uh, that the train was uh, going to VARS and that uh, Santa Claus would be arriving at that location by helicopter. So uh, this continued to be something that happened each year was that local kids would come. Um, and the village eventually started organizing um, a, a special event for the kids afterwards so that they had something else uh, uh, to enjoy about the day aside from, from meeting Santa Claus in the field. Uh, here you can see uh, the train stopped on the tracks right beside the field. Um, it was quite a long train, uh, 18 cars long. Uh, this was uh, relatively uh, lengthy for a passenger train of its day. Um, there were about 78 passengers per car, uh, which would be pretty crowded. Um, CN provided older coaches for this charter service, uh, which was fine since the older coaches were mainly notable for their lack of air conditioning, which didn't matter in the middle of November. Uh, CN would still have owned a large number of these older coaches, uh, which dated from about the 1920s. Um, they had only just replaced these coaches on their mainline trains with brand new uh, streamlined equipment in 1954. So these were yet to be retired and were available for the charter service. Um, most of the cars were likely brought in from Montreal uh, just for this train because there, there wouldn't have been a sufficient supply of, of cars just uh, at the Ottawa station to, uh, to run an 18 car special. Um, so here's Santa Claus uh, saying goodbye to uh, the local children as he gets ready to board on the train. Uh, you can see the faces of the train's passengers pressed up against the window in the background. Um, I, I'm not sure who the gentleman is uh, on the left. Um, he might be associated with Freemans. Uh, he may be a railway employee or he might be a local dignitary. But um, in any case, uh, there's Santa Claus. And uh, he then got on the rear of the train and uh, said goodbye to Vars for one last time. Um, and Vars, uh, in turn, uh, said goodbye to him. Uh, all the enthusiastic kids uh, uh, you would never see a scene like this today. They wouldn't, they wouldn't allow um, a crowd of kids onto the track beside a train that was about to move. But uh, that was the 50s, and so that was how things went. Um, once the train got rolling, uh, Santa Claus walked through every single car, greeting the children as he went. Um, with 18 cars to work through and only about half an hour to do it in, his schedule would have been pretty tight. Uh, however, in addition to a quick visit from Santa, all the children on the train were also uh, recipients of uh, cookies and other treats from Santa's helpers, uh, who were actually employees of the Morrison-Lamoth Bakery. So um, they got uh, 
more than just uh, uh, the uh, joy of of being able to see Santa, they they got uh, uh, a little bit of um, a sugary treat as well. All too soon, uh, the train arrived back at Union Station. This would have been at 10.30 in the morning uh, on the Saturday. Uh, and Santa Claus disembarked uh, and uh, was greeted there by uh, the mayor, Charlotte Witten, a uh, close friend of Lawrence Freeman, uh, who uh, it was active with him uh, in, in many charitable activities. Um, uh, but uh, here she is uh, wearing her tricorn hat and her robe and uh, chain of office, reading uh, an official proclamation welcoming Santa to Ottawa. Uh, one of the news reports also said that she gave him a map so that he would know his way around the city to be able to deliver presents to all of the kids. <laughs> um, in addition to uh, the mayor, uh, Santa was greeted by the band of the Governor General's uh, foot guards um, uh, and uh, the majorettes of the Ottawa Rough Riders, uh, and a bunch of performers dressed in animal costumes, uh, which uh, was kind of interesting. There was also a large crowd of um, both children and adults who had not had the opportunity to ride the train, but were there to greet Santa. Uh, so Santa, again, um, escorted by the, uh, the band of the uh, Governor General's foot guards, uh, went through the crowd and proceeded out the side entrance of the station to Little Sussex Street, uh, where a float with uh, a sleigh and a reindeer was waiting for him uh, to go on a short parade, um, which uh, would take him to the Freeman's store. Um, if you know the geography of this area, you'll know that uh, the, the distance from uh, the side of of, uh, of of the building there, which is still there, to the front of 73 Rideau is only a couple of blocks. So it was a very, very short Santa Claus parade. But uh, nonetheless, it was a parade and it happened uh, uh, every year until the train stopped running uh, with floats and everything. Uh, the following year and up until 1960, um, it was Mayor George Nelms who had uh, uh, replaced Charlotte Witten uh, in 1957, uh, who greeted Santa Claus. Um, and here you can see um, some young women dressed, I think, as elves. I'm not sure. Uh, but again, uh, the mayor, uh, with his uh, ceremonial scroll and official proclamation, not wearing a tricorn hat, not wearing a robe or a chain of office, but uh, otherwise still representing the city uh, in uh, dignified fashion, uh, greeting Santa Claus, welcoming him to the city. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, many, many children crowded around to, uh, uh, greet Santa at the station, um, who had not had the, uh, good fortune to, to be one of those on the train. So this was pretty much how things went for, um, the next, uh, uh, several years, um. Unfortunately, in 1958, a uh, heavy fog meant that uh, the helicopter part of the event didn't happen. So uh, rather than flying by helicopter out to Vars, uh, Santa Claus had to be driven out there. But he did take the train back and there was still a parade. Um, uh, there was also supposed to be a helicopter visit by Santa Claus to the Westgate uh, Freeman's store, but uh, that was also cancelled due to fog. Um, in 1962 and 1963, the helicopter was also grounded. Uh, in both of those years, it was due to heavy rain uh, rather than fog. Uh, but other than those three years, the arrival by helicopter in the field was uh, a, a constant feature of the Santa Claus train experience. Something funny happened, a bit of a, a political uh, um, boondoggle in 1964. Um, so Charlotte Witten uh, had been reelected in 1960. She was running for mayor again in 1964, uh, but she was uh, contested in that election by Frank Ryan, who was the owner of the CFRA radio station, as well as city controller Don Reed. Um, now, a few days before the 1964 train was uh, supposed to depart, uh, some news came out uh, that... Uh, uh, members of the committee to elect Frank Ryan would be boarding the train and distributing buttons saying, uh, I'm for Ryan, uh, to all of the children aboard. 
uh, when uh, Controller Reed heard this, um, he, excuse my dog, one of my two, uh, when Controller Reed heard about uh, this scheme of, of Frank Ryan's, he announced that he would be boarding the train and giving a lollipop uh, to every child who had received a button in exchange for being given given the button. Um, in the end, for whatever reason, um, uh, Reed was not on the train, but Frank Ryan's uh, campaign workers were. And so when the train arrived in Auto Union Station, uh, the vast majority of the children and many of the parents were wearing these I'm for Ryan buttons. Uh, notwithstanding that uh, um, campaign stunt, uh, Frank Ryan was not successful in the 1964 mayoral election, nor was Charlotte Witten. And in fact, Don Reed uh, ended up handily defeating both of them uh, on December 7th of that year uh, and was then mayor for the next four years. As long as uh, Union Station remained open, uh, things stayed pretty consistent. And that was true for really the first 10 years that the train was in operation. So from 1956 until 1965, uh, the train would arrive, the mayor would be present, uh, a proclamation would be read, um, and then uh, uh, a parade would happen from uh, Union Station to Freeman's. Um, however, uh, in 1966, the old Union Station closed um, and the new station opened out in Alta Vista. So that meant that the 1966 Santa Claus train had to depart from and return to Alta Vista. Uh, which in turn meant that Santa Claus, after uh, disembarking from the train, had to be driven downtown um, and the parade route was changed. So instead of going from the old Union Station, it now went from the Freeman's Warehouse on York Street uh, over to Cumberland uh, and then along Rideau uh, back to the uh, Freeman store. Uh, and that was how the parade was uh, until uh, the very end of operations, uh, which was in 1972. So uh, this is a photo showing um, a gray and misty uh, Saturday, November 4th, 1972. Um, the train had had, uh, the train had 22 cars, um, uh, which is the longest it ever was. Um, however, it, it uh, only had 1,800 passengers, uh, which was not the most passengers it had ever had. So um, at some point in the past, they'd managed to pack even more people into slightly fewer cars. Um, but still, it was uh, it, it remained uh, every bit as popular uh, in 1972 as it had been throughout its its life. Um, however, uh, Freeman's was no more. Um, the, having been sold in 1971, um, in 1973, uh, the Bay took over and the Hudson's Bay Company was not interested in running Santa Claus trains. Um, it's a bit remarkable, in fact, that in 1972, uh, when the store was in transition, still called Freeman's, but owned by the Bay, um, management must have somehow managed to figure out a way uh, to operate the train. Uh, whether they got head office approval to do so, I don't know. But uh, and in any case, uh, 1972 was the last year for Freeman's as uh, the name of the store, and it was also the last year for uh, the train. Here you can see the train uh, just passing the uh, old CN station in Vars. Um, the locomotive uh, has, uh, it's actually two locomotives, uh, uh, which you would have noticed in the last picture, have run around the train so that they're at the front for the return trip to Ottawa. Uh, you can see the two white flags on either side of the locomotive, which are uh, railway signaling to indicate that this train is an extra train, not a regularly scheduled train. Um, and you can see that the station uh, remains apparently open um, uh, with somebody standing uh, just barely visible in the, the station door beside the bay window. Um, but uh, by 1972, uh, uh, the station was already uh, de-staffed by CN. In, in 1970, they had actually received permission to remove their station agent, who was the person responsible for selling tickets. Um, so, uh, the only person who would have been left would have been perhaps a, ter a caretaker, um, but, uh, uh, but the station was still open as a shelter for, uh, passengers who, uh, at that point could still board trains, uh, most likely heading in, heading to Montreal, 
uh, um, since it was highly unlikely that anyone at that point would have ridden a train between Vars and Ottawa uh, over only 17 and a half miles. A few years later, the station was all boarded up um, and, uh, and completely closed. Um, and uh, many stations of this type uh, were shortly thereafter demolished. Um, some of them burned, uh, but uh, the railway companies had no interest in keeping abandoned stations beside their active railway lines. Uh, they were uh, an insurance liability. They were uh, a hazard for various safety reasons. Um, and so the stations generally disappeared. Uh, very fortunately for the virus station, however, uh, it did not suffer that fate. Um, it did not remain in the village, but it did survive. Um, and in 1976, it was moved by road um, to the Cumberland Heritage Village Museum, uh, which uh, is where it is today um, and where you can still go um, and see uh, the interior of what uh, uh, would have been a working station with um, telegraph key and uh, baggage and various other accoutrements of a railway station, um, as well as many other preserved buildings which have been uh, relocated to the village. Um, so uh, if you haven't been, um, it's a bit of a trek out from uh, uh, the west end of Ottawa or the center of Ottawa, but it's right out in the east end in Cumberland, and it's well worth a visit, uh, uh, not just for the, the station building, but for uh, many other reasons besides. Uh, you can see that there's a short piece of track um, that has been placed on, on the ground uh, in front of the station. Uh, of course, this is um, just for show, uh, although there is, or at least was last time I was there, a caboose uh, that was sitting on the track uh, just to provide a little bit more railway flavor to the display. So um, this is the end for uh, the Freeman's train. Um, and uh, you could really never um, operate a train like this uh, today um, because of a variety of reasons. For one thing, uh, the railway companies, uh, VIA now, uh, don't have uh, the surplus uh, equipment to operate charters. They, they tend to run with just barely enough equipment to operate their regularly scheduled trains. Um, so even if they had an interest in offering a charter, they, they couldn't because of a lack of equipment, um, lack of staff. Um, uh, insurance is also a factor. Um, the cost to provide insurance for uh, something like this would be uh, very high today. Um, so unfortunately, uh, we're probably never going to see something like this. Uh, but it does survive in the memories of uh, the the thousands of Ottawans who, as children, uh, had the experience uh, to ride the train over its 17 years of existence. Um, and um, if you are looking for uh, a railway experience at Christmas that's not quite um, uh, as, as perhaps as, as magical as, as uh, riding a train out to a mystery destination where Santa arrives on a helicopter, uh, there are still some Christmas railway type experiences that you can have um, among them uh, locally to Ottawa uh, or not not too far from Ottawa anyway uh, are the uh, Railway Museum of Eastern Ontario's North Pole Express, um, which is a special event that happens on Saturdays at the end of November and early December each year. Um, and uh, people can ride in a caboose. Uh, they can have a story read to them by Mrs. Santa Claus, uh, tell Santa Claus what they want for Christmas, uh, enjoy hay rides and various other activities. Um, and uh, all of this is, uh, is uh, again, hosted by, by the Railway Museum of uh, Eastern Ontario in Smith Falls, which is a great place to go visit at any time of the year that it's open. Um, but this is particularly an enjoyable experience at Christmas time. So uh, that really brings my presentation to a conclusion. I'd like to thank uh, all of the people who provided photos um, and assistance and uh, information to help with my presentation. Um, it has been an absolute uh, pleasure to be able to talk about this train. Uh, I... Um, I, I 
I'm sure that there are, are, are those of you in the audience who have your own memories of Freeman's and memories of, of perhaps riding this train yourself. Um, and uh, um, uh, I, I, those those memories are, are something that uh, I could never adequately capture in a presentation like this, but I hope I have at least uh, stirred some of those good thoughts about, about uh, the experience that you had in the past. Um, and I will be happy now to hand things over to Barry Podolsky, um, who is going to moderate and uh, um, take questions, uh, which hopefully I'll be able to answer. Thank you. Well, Andrew, thank you for this presentation. I'm Barry Podolsky, and I will be the moderator of what I expect to have quite a few questions and uh, perhaps even some nostalgic comments uh, that might trigger some more thoughts from you. What I wanted to uh, let the audience know, and I think we have uh, over 80 people uh, listening in, so Andrew, be prepared for uh, a lot of uh, questions. This will be a real test of your uh, heritage memory. Um, I'd just like to remind uh, everybody listening that you can pose your questions on the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of your screen. I'll give you a chance to look for it, but please uh, put your questions on there and I will, uh, they're starting to come in right now. So I will um, scrutinize them and try to summarize them so that uh, Andrew can give you a response. The one thing before we start is that uh, I was really, I felt, emotionally uh, connected to the first uh, Santa train, not because I was on it, but because that was the year 1956 that I arrived, uh, I immigrated from Winnipeg to Ottawa, and I arrived by train, a CPR train that happens at this very station. So that was just a few months before the Santa special. And uh, at the time, I didn't particularly have all that much interest in Santa Claus and other things on my mind. But let's get to the questions. And here's a really good one that I hope you're prepared for. And that uh, is, who were the Santas that were in uh, those costumes? Do we have any record of who they were? That is a terrific question. And I really wish I knew. Um... Freeman's recruited these Santa Clauses and had been doing so for many years beforehand. Uh, it was the same Santa Claus uh, who would preside over Toyland in, in their store, uh, who rode on the train. Um, and of course, if you look at the photos, you can see that the beard is fake, the hair is, is, is fake. The, the, these were uh, um, performers, but um, I don't have any information about who they were. Uh, it's not recorded in any of the uh, uh, newspaper articles or other research materials that I've been able to find on the train. Um, if I ever do find out, I would certainly incorporate that into this presentation because that is a good question. And it, it definitely, you can tell from the photos that it was different Santa Clauses from year to year. But uh, as to who they actually were, I, I simply don't know. Now, oh, another question, um, and this one is probably something that uh, we would all like to know. How did you first get interested in this subject? It's a very nostalgic and esoteric uh, local uh, story. And what, what drew you to it? So it kind of came in a backwards fashion. Um, I had been interested in railway history for a very, very long time. Since I was a kid, I, I inherited this from my dad, who Heritage Ottawa people know well. Um, and I became particularly interested in, in railway stations and was doing a lot of research into railway stations. Uh, in particular, uh, the hows and whys of how railway stations got um, relocated and and whether or not... Um, relocation was was the best or, or indeed only solution for, for a train station uh, that had lost its, its use to the railway. Uh, and that ended up uh, taking me out to the Cumberland Heritage Village Museum and to uh, experiencing the VAR station for the first time. Um, it also took me to the uh, Cumberland Township Historical Society and their archives. 
Um, and that was where I started to see photos and uh, noticed that they, they had some information about Santa Claus trains that had run out to Vars. So at this point, I didn't know anything about the connection to Freeman's. Uh, I, I, uh, I only knew that there had been uh, some sort of uh, train uh, that had run to Vars at some point in, in the past. Uh, and so I started to do some more digging and I, I found out about the Freeman's connection um, and I became interested in, in Freeman's and the Freeman family for a, a variety of different reasons. Um, I know that there has been, there are other people who are, who are much more expert than I am on the history of uh, department stores in Ottawa and, and Heritage Ottawa had a lecture on the history of department stores uh, in Ottawa a couple of years ago. Um, I'm not sure whether there has ever been a Heritage Ottawa lecture or presentation specifically about the Freeman family. Uh, there are a couple of books. There's uh, um, Lawrence Freeman's autobiography. There's a biography of Lillian Freeman. Um, but it kind of all came together. Um, uh, building on on this interest in railway operations and railway stations and railways as places and um, how neat it was that Union Station in downtown Ottawa was connected with this little village out in, in the middle of nowhere. Um, and uh, it just kind of snowballed from there. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's one of many, many topics I've become interested in over the years, but it, it certainly has kind of a tug on the heartstrings uh, just because of the... the uh, um, the seasonal connection, but but also again, I, I find it really interesting to think about um, the lives of of people uh, like the Freemans uh, who were um, very successful in Ottawa, very much a part of the community, but also kind of apart from apart from the community. In in a sense, it's it's a little bit hard to explain. Um, uh, but creating this 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 experience that was so memorable for so many Ottawans and became part of of the the, the life of Ottawa and 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 what was special about Christmas. It's a very rambling answer, um, but the short the short of it is it, it goes back to um, being interested in how railways touch people's lives. One of the things that uh, one of the listeners has uh, has asked because of the in the photographs you see all these smiling children uh, they're obviously very excited about this very memorable for them have you ever identified or have you ever spoken to any of the children who rode the train and so, if so did you get any of their memories I, I and again I I have um when I was out in the archives uh, of the uh, Cumberland Township Historical Society, I did speak to uh, one person uh, since passed away uh, who had been one of the kids standing in the field, um, not riding the train, but but standing in the field uh, in VARS uh, to meet Santa Claus when he, he uh, disembarked from his helicopter. Um, I haven't, uh, to, to my chagrin, um, been able to talk to uh, anybody who uh, specifically rode the train. Um, uh, when I gave my presentation in 2012, um, there was one person in the audience who said, oh, I rode the train as an adult, and I don't think I was supposed to be on the train because I wasn't chaperoning anybody, but somehow he had talked his way on. So I remember that, but uh, but no. Uh, other than that, unfortunately not. And there are still a lot of people. I mean, 1972 does seem like a long time ago, but there's a lot of people who are around then, who are still around today. Um, and indeed, people who were around in 1956. Uh, so um, perhaps something I should be pursuing more in the future. Now, Andrew, um, a side question, and this is about Union Station, some building that uh, you know quite a bit about and which is iconic in the center of Ottawa. A question was, can you imagine that the public will ever have access to Union Station again now that it's the Senate? Well, I mean, the public does have a certain measure of access because you can go on <clears throat> tour when the Senate is in session, um, which in fact is in some ways better than the public access while it was the government conference center. Um, 
it used to be open uh, for Doors Open weekend, and and uh, my dad and I were tour guides there uh, during Doors Open for for quite a few years. Um, but most of the time uh, during those years, it was it was closed to the public, and you could only go in there if you were uh, attending a, a a meeting or a special event that was was hosted in in the building. Um, we'll see what happens. Uh, at some point in the future, the renovations to the center block will come to an end and some decisions will have to be taken about what the Senate does then. Uh, I presume they will want to move back into the center block and that will then leave this building vacant um, and looking for yet another vocation. Um, but I think it's really too early to tell. I think the Senate is going to be in there for quite a while yet to come. Uh, so um, who knows what things people will value and and uh, what uh, measures people will be prepared to take uh, to to bring a building like this back into uh, greater public life uh, 10 years from now or, 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 or so. So we'll see what happens. Andrew, if you have the patience, uh, perhaps the next question might lead you into a book on a related subject, and that is, uh, those who have lived in other cities, whether it's Toronto or Winnipeg or Chicago or New York, uh, you know, have lived through and have nostalgic reminiscences of the Santa Claus parades. And uh, you mentioned a little bit about the Freeman's uh, Christmas shop windows. Well, those, of course, were quite common in cities all across North America. Uh, are you tempted to follow up? with expanding this uh, little monograph on the Freeman train to looking at Santa Claus parades and uh, toy lands and uh, the kind of uh, model trains that were quite often uh, located and gave rides to kids in toy lands. Is this um, another, uh, is there a book in this, maybe a film or a series? Oh my goodness. Um... Books are such a hard thing to get into because um, it's difficult to get books published these days. Um, uh, the The real catalyst for getting a, a book published would be uh, having really good quality photos. Um, a large catalyst for this presentation was ultimately uh, finding the photos in the Andrews Newton collection at the City of Ottawa archives, uh, which make up most of the most of the images of the Santa Claus train uh, are actually from that collection. And without those photos, I don't think I could have done this. Um, if I was to look to um, a, a sort of a, a broader topic, um, that would involve a lot of digging into archives and probably archives from all across North America to to be able to to get the the scope of it. Might be better to scope it down to just Canada and just talk about things like. <laughs> uh, the Santa Claus parade in Toronto and uh, and and Eaton's connection to that and um, department stores that that had, as you say, um, extensive Christmas displays, um, because if you were to start to talk about the ones that they have in, in the United States, uh, it would be unending and, and uh, you'd need a team of research assistants who would have to probably spend 10 years doing it. It's an interesting idea. Um, certainly, I would I would like to to use this material that I have um, in, in some other way. Um, so we'll see. We'll see what, what comes out of it. Uh, I, I do have, you know, bits and pieces about the, the other uh, cities like, like Winnipeg and Toronto and Montreal uh, and what, what they had uh, that was connected to this same theme. So it, it's, it's not impossible. Now, Andrew, I have a few minutiae questions that people have asked. So this is a real test of uh, your uh, your research. Do you mind if I give them to you? Um, one of the questions was, um, let me see here now. Uh, you had mentioned something about uh, the Railway Museum in Eastern Ontario. Could you just repeat again where that yes. is? So it's in Smith's Falls, uh, which is about an hour's drive uh, south of Ottawa. Um, uh, if uh, if you uh, just do an internet search for Railway Museum of Eastern Ontario, you'll find it. It'll be the first hit. Um, perhaps uh, when this video goes up on YouTube, 
uh, we can provide a link in the in the description below the video uh, to that. Um, it's not hard to find once you actually get to the town. Um, uh, it's just on sort of the the west side of of, of Smith Falls, which is not a large town. And uh, for those who know the Rideau Canal, you'll know that there's a an interesting lift bridge that goes over the canal. Um, it, that's that's actually itself a National Historic Site of Canada. Uh, that's that's the old railway lift bridge, and that led to the the station that is where the the railway museum is located. So, um, yeah. Um, I don't. I can't give you the street address, but if if you if you look up uh, Smiths Falls Railway Museum or Railway Museum of Eastern Ontario, I guarantee you will find it. Now, Andrew, another uh, short question, and that was, uh, you had named the helicopter company. Could you repeat what the name of it was for one of our listeners? Yeah, it was Spartan Air Services. Okay, there we go. They, for those they were famous those. for for doing aerial survey and mapping work uh, after the Second World War. Now you'll be pleased to know, um, Andrew, that two of the people on this uh, on this uh, session have some reminiscences. And one said, "I took my two year old son on the nineteen seventy two train. Now oh, he's a teacher." But he has no memory of the train. <laughs> Understandable. And, and another one uh, was that, thank you for the memory. I was lucky to be on the Santa Claus train. So there are a few people that do remember it. Well, that's great. Um, um, I, again, you know, I, I, I wish I, I, I had those memories myself. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit too young for that too, but uh, um, uh absolutely wonderful that uh, that at least a couple of people have first person memories of it who are uh, uh, on this uh, presentation tonight. Yeah, well, you have a lot of warmth uh, out there and uh, in response to your presentation, uh, suggestions like uh, posted on Facebook, perhaps a flood of memories will result and uh, will it be or the one of the questions, when will it be on YouTube? And I suppose it's going to be very timely, wouldn't it? Um, I'm not sure exactly. That's that's a good question, and that's probably something that uh, um, uh, Jennifer Lane or or somebody from uh, from Heritage Ottawa can answer. But uh, probably won't take too long, I would imagine, to get the recording up on YouTube. By the way, do you know who the person was that actually came up with the idea of the Freeman Santa train? I don't. Um, uh, I. I, 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 again, Lawrence Freeman wrote his own autobiography. He didn't mention it. Um, it's not mentioned in any of the newspaper articles from 1956. Um, so um, that's that's an interesting question. Whether it was 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 Lawrence Freeman himself or one of his uh, staff at the store who who came up with the idea. Uh, nobody had ever thought of doing something like this before. So so it was an innovation, but. Uh, um, who had the, the spark of innovation to do that? I don't know. Well, it's part of the mystery then, just like Vars was at the beginning. Yeah. Well, I think that uh, we probably should be wrapping it up very soon. Um, I don't know if there are any other last minute questions that we want to uh, uh, invite people to ask you. Oh, here's one. Um, do you know Lillian Freeman's maiden name? Was she an Ottawa woman? Yes, she was. Um, her maiden name was Bilski. Um, and she was the daughter of an Ottawa merchant named Moses Bilski. Um, so she was a she was a prominent, she was a member of a prominent family as well. Um, and uh, as I say, her her biography has been written. Um I don't remember the title or the author of it at, at this moment, which I'm, I'm embarrassed about because I did, I did look at it uh, when I was researching this. It didn't have much to say about the Santa Claus train or anything to say about the Santa Claus train, but it did have quite a bit to say about the Freeman family and their relations to uh, um, Ottawa society. So um, uh, um, a good... Uh, there, there are some good resources online from the Ottawa Jewish Archives 
Um, and uh, um, quite a few, um, uh, as I say, books. Uh, there have been uh, several articles published um, and, uh, and, and, and a fair amount of information online, uh, both uh, through official sources or semi-official sources like, like archives, but also through uh, people's blogs and things like that. Uh, quite a lot published about, about uh, the Freemans and uh, their activities in Ottawa. Well, Andrew, on that note, uh, we're going to wrap things up now. And to the listeners, if you have any additional questions, please email them to Heritage Ottawa, and we'll share them with Andrew, and I'm sure he'd be happy to send the email response. Absolutely. Andrew, thank you once again for this uh, presentation. I loved it. Um, I have a soft spot for, uh, for Christmas and for Santa. And now I'd also like to remind you all that Heritage Ottawa's next lecture will be taking place on January 17th, 2024. Uh, this presentation will be led by landscape architect John Zvoner, and he'll transport us to warmer days with his talk on Maple Lawn's Walled Garden of Delight, 30 years of stewardship. Remember, pre-registration is required and is available on the Heritage Ottawa website. Finally, um, as mentioned at the beginning, Heritage Ottawa electors are provided free of charge. We encourage you to join Heritage Ottawa if you're not yet a member and to donate to the organization to help continue efforts to share heritage stories. Information is available on the Heritage Ottawa website. And with that, thank you, Andrew, and thank you all for joining us. <laughs>